What if I told you that most of the Reformed or Calvinist preachers that you have heard of or maybe even listened to are not actually Reformed? Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where I build this big church in Minecraft while I talk about Christianity. So today I'm going to be talking about a recent... Um, when I say recent, I mean recent in church history, meaning the past 20 years. Recent sort of movement called the New Calvinism, and it's not really a, much of a thing anymore. It's mostly a thing like one or two decades ago. But even so, most of the Reformed or Calvinist preachers that are really famous these days are part of that. And um, I'm going to talk about how the New Calvinism was good in some ways. I, for like a couple years... Um, was um part of it ish but why i still think it's not really calvinist or reformed in a true historical sense it takes aspects of reformed theology and some people in it are more reformed than others but um there are many reasons to say yeah it's not really uh reformed and people like me it's have become kind of a meme among like you know among people who are still in that movement, they think we're a bunch of just, you know, nitpicky gatekeepers who become the ultimate, you know, judges of who's reformed and who's not, and we think we're the new John Calvins who get to decide. And yeah, I know we get made fun of, and I make fun of myself for that too, um, but I, I do think we have a, a real historical basis for um, saying what we do about this. So, uh, yeah. Some figures that um, are in this movement, and some of these people are more legitimately reformed than others, are Tim Keller, R.C. Sproul, John MacArthur, uh, Steve Lawson, Paul Washer, Jeff Durbin, James White, and honestly, basically every famous Calvinist preacher, contemporary Calvinist that you've heard of, is in this part of this new Calvinism movement. And in more recent years, like, since the movement's mostly fallen apart now, it's kind of split into a more conservative version with John MacArthur, Paul Washer, um, Steve Lawson, and formerly R.C. Sproul, may he rest in peace, and um, a more liberal version with, like, Tim Keller and the Gospel Coalition and John Piper. Um... So, yeah, right now it's, it's, the movement's mostly dead. A lot of people have left it and gone to more, like, traditional, um, historically rooted, uh, Christian traditions, like Anglicanism or Lutheranism or maybe even Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. And honestly, I think that's kind of a good thing, because while I do think the movement has some merit to it, it's really kind of gives Calvinism a bad name and misrepresents it in some ways. So, okay, I've been, I've been making assertions here with um, no historical evidence to back it up, so what the heck am I even talking about? Alright, so, uh, first of all, Reformed theology and Calvinism, I'm going to be using those two words mostly interchangeably in this video, are not, ah, uh, okay, uh, are not, uh, for those of you who are just listening to the audio, I walked and then there was a creeper in my room who almost blew up all my stuff. Okay, Reformed theology and Calvinism are not what a lot of people think they are. People treat them as just a single set of beliefs on how salvation works. So, um, it's often represented with the acronym TULIP. So Calvinism means you agree with the five points of TULIP. And if you agree with all five points, you're fully Calvinist. If you agree with four points, you're 80% Calvinist. So. The five points are total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. I have other videos where I go more in-depth, in but the five points of Calvinism weren't written by Calvin, and the, five, the acronym TULIP was written in the 20th century to represent, and I would say poorly represent, um, what was written in the ca Canons of Dort, which came, I think, a hundred or so years after Calvin, sort of responding to critics of Calvin. But Calvin's theology wasn't just um, the, the five points of the doctrines of grace. Calvin had a whole big system of theology, and that was just one small part of it. So Calvinism, therefore, isn't just a belief on how salvation works. Calvinism is a whole entire system of theology um, that covers every single theological issue. So, no, it's not just belief in predestination that's part of Calvinism, but there are a lot of people who call themselves Calvinists, 
but the only thing they're really Calvinist on is the doctrine of predestination. Other parts of Calvinism are, for example, this is the most telling one, other parts of Calvinism are the belief that um, in Holy Communion, in the Lord's Supper, we receive Jesus' true body and blood. And I don't think you're going to hear people like John MacArthur saying that. They're going to call that, like, evil Catholic belief or whatever. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, someone like John MacArthur is someone who is only really Calvinist, sort of, um, on his view of predestination. Now, I'm not saying these pastors are bad pastors. I'm not saying you should stop listening to them. I'm saying that um, I think they might not have the best idea of what reformed means. Now, I don't think you need to be reformed to be uh, an awesome Christian. I respect Christians of all different um, uh, traditions as long as they're, you know, historically rooted in the in the ecumenical creeds. But um, just from a historical standpoint, people like John MacArthur are not reformed in a historical sense. So if you believe the sacraments, meaning baptism and the Lord's Supper, are basically just symbols, then you're not really reformed because... The, the Lord's Supper, the sacraments, was the most divisive issue in the Protestant Reformation. It's what separated the Lutherans from the Calvinists from the Anabaptists. So, um, Calvinism, therefore, is not just a single belief, it's a whole tradition. And historically, the Calvinists excluded anyone who would not affirm that, you know, in the, in the Lord's Supper, we receive Christ's true body and blood. So yeah, if someone doesn't believe that, even though they might be really cool, even though they might have a lot of good things to say, I don't think they can rightly be called a Calvinist, if that makes any sense. Because it just blatantly goes against what John Calvin himself taught. Um, but, like, like I said, it does not mean they're not a good preacher, it does not mean I want you to stop listening to them, or, or anything like that. Okay, are we clear? Yeah, that's one thing. So, um, another thing is... Cal uh, Calvinism, Reformed theology, is not compatible with dispensationalism or a belief in the rapture. Calvin part of Calvinism is covenant theology, which sees scripture through the lens of one covenant. So there's a lot of continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and that the church today is really just a continuation of Israel and the Old Testament. The church is Israel. There's not some separate plan that God has for uh, the Jews as an ethnic group. And some people like John MacArthur have attacked this view as, as in his own exact words, a form of latent anti-Semitism. And that's just ridiculous. Like, I'm actually ethnically Jewish myself, and I, I reject his idea that God has some special plan for the Jews. I, I think the most plan there would be for the Jews is, now this is compatible with covenant theology, is that eventually they'll be brought back into the family of God. Uh, but I think that's really as far as it goes. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think it's anti-Semitic in any way to say that... Um, I don't, yeah, I don't think that's anti-Semitic at all. <laughs> to say that like there's really nothing spiritually special about the Jewish people anymore. Like, they're not special any more special than Portuguese people, spiritually speaking. Um, Jews have the same command as everyone else to repent and believe the gospel. Now, I don't think John MacArthur would deny that. There are some, like, more wacky dispensationalists who do. I don't, I don't think he does. But he, um, he still thinks that the promises um, made to Israel these days still refer to the Jews as, like, a biological ethnic group, whereas traditional covenant theology, covenant theology is part of Calvinism, says you know, um, the church is a continuation of Israel, so the promises made to Israel uh, refer to the church. And that's not inconsistent because the church is Israel. Israel is not some ethnic group. Israel is God's people. And God's people has been expanded to the whole church. Um, and also, baptism makes you part of God's covenant. That's another part of covenant theology that um, frequently gets left out by some of those more dispensationalist preachers. Uh so yeah, if you are a dispensationalist or if you believe in the rapture, now the rapture is a doctrine that was developed in the 1800s in America. It's not consistent with church history at all. Um, so no, no one who believes in the rapture, like John MacArthur or Steve Lawson, can be really considered a Calvinist, in my opinion. Um, because Calvinism just flies in the face of, of that. Um, something else is that Calvinism considers itself, this might shock you, it considers itself a continuation 
of um, of the Catholic Church, of the, the Western um, Catholic Church, but a version of it that's purified by the gospel. So um, a lot of modern Calvinist preachers see some sort of radical discontinuity between themselves and the Roman Catholic Church, that they basically think uh, the Protestant Reformation, Reformation was the Protestant Rev Revolution. But historically, Calvinists have seen themselves as a continuation of Catholicism, not some sort of replacement of it. They thought that since Rome went astray, they were the, the true Catholic Church. Lutherans are the same way. Um, contrast, so like, that's why um, we shouldn't throw out everything from Catholicism. We need to just filter between the good and the bad. So anything that's like inconsistent with church history, like the rapture, I would say is inconsistent with Calvinism. So Calvinism is not meant to be a, a radical departure from church history. And if you hear preachers like John MacArthur completely disregard the authority of church history and say, our only authority is the Bible, not church history. And a lot of, uh, a lot of so-called reform people like MacArthur and Lawson will speak like that. Now it is true uh, that Calvinists, along with Lutherans and all other historic Protestants, believe in sola scriptura. That means the Bible is our highest authority. It's our only infallible authority. But church history is still a lower authority, and it's still um, a lens that we use to interpret the Bible. And it's not because any of the popes were infallible. It's not because the early church had um, some sort of apostolic authority. But it's because... Um, we need to learn from the wisdom of those who, who have come before us. And the Holy Spirit did promise to guide the church. So if some view is completely different than the vast majority of church history, it's probably wrong. And the rapture falls under that. So if you read the Bible and completely ignore church history, you can make a bit of a case for the rapture. But if you know church history, if you know the context in which the New Testament was written, there's really no good argument for the rapture at all. So... Um, yeah, so I, I've addressed some of the more radical um, ha reasons why more radical like dispensationalists cannot be considered really reformed. What about some more like more historical reformed Baptists like John Piper or James White or even some Presbyterians like Tim Keller and R.C. Sproul? Uh, now the Keller and Sproul, I'd say they are they de they definitely are reformed, but because they interact with so many people who are not, they. Um, they're influenced by them in some ways, and that's why Keller and Sproul have a lower view of the sacraments than is proper in Reformed theology, because the new Calvinism was really a union of Presbyterians and Reformed Baptists. So that means, and uh, whenever Presbyterians and Baptists unite, it's always the Baptist views on things that win out that become the just sort of general assumption, because Baptists are less traditional than Presbyterians. When a more traditional thing unites with a less traditional thing, the less traditional thing will always win out, because that means if they're sacrificing their traditions, they're going to lose their traditions. It's the same deal when Lutherans, who are more traditional than Presbyterians, mix with Presbyterians, Lutherans always end up losing their traditions, and that's why Lutherans, understandably so, I think, don't always like to um, unite with Presbyterians, and that makes sense. So because the new Calvinism was a mix of Presbyterians and Reformed Baptists, as a whole, it's basically just Reformed Baptist. It's not like half Presbyterian, half Reformed Baptist. It's, it's Reformed Baptist. So that's why even the Presbyterians who are part of it do depart from uh, classic Reformed theology in some ways. Now, R.C. Sproul is definitely much more um, classically Reformed than John MacArthur, but R.C. Sproul was still, like, best friends with John MacArthur and would always, like, you know, do a lot of ministry partners with John MacArthur, and they would... They would it, like their joint things would be considered like reform just as a whole. So yeah, we can't pretend that even though R.C. Sproul is great and is I highly recommend his lectures, we can't pretend he hasn't been influenced by Reformed Baptists. And even though he's great, I think he's a little bit overrated in the Reformed world. I think there are um, people like Michael Horton and R. Scott Clark are more like uh, more solidly rooted in the Reformed tradition and uh, have distanced themselves from this sort of new Calvinism stuff. So yeah, Michael Horton and R. Scott Clark, I would say they're the truly reformed ones, and I'm making fun of myself a bit here. They get the truly reformed Presbyterian stamp of approval from me, um, because of course I, I am the ultimate arbiter of who's of reformed truth, and I'm the ultimate judge of who's really reformed and who's not. Uh, that, that was sarcastic. But, um, 
But yeah, so um, people like John Piper and James White, it's like, I think they're definitely more reformed than John MacArthur or uh, Steve Lawson. But even so, they have a very low view of the sacraments. They treat the sacraments as basically just symbolic. I did listen to this, like, six-hour lecture series from James White just to try and find out what his views of the Lord's Supper are. And he has what I would call a a pseudo-reformed view or a presbyterian view that says, yeah, we don't really think it's just a symbol, but then when they explain it, it really is just a symbol. Um, so basically... Uh, I have other videos about this. The, pres the Reformed or the Presbyterian uh, view of the Lord's Supper is that we really receive Jesus' true body and blood. We just receive it spiritually, not physically. But what we receive is Jesus' true body and blood, and that's not some metaphor for having faith. Um, and Jesus is truly present in a sense other than the sense in which he's present at all times. The Reformed Baptist view, uh, I mean, first, well, the, the sort of Zwinglian general baptist view is it's just a symbol nothing else the only thing we're doing in the lord's supper is remembering what christ did for us so the sort of reformed baptist or presbyterian or pseudo calvinist view that people like james white and john piper and um others hold is that yes um it's more than just a symbol but it's that since christ is present everywhere when we're reminded of his presence in the lord's supper um, it becomes more real to us, or they might say we receive Jesus' true body and blood, but they define that as just a metaphor for having faith. But there is a part in John Calvin's writings, in John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, where he said, um, he said that he is not satisfied with those who acknowledge we have some communion with Christ, but who leave out all mentions that we receive his true body and blood. And because of the influence of the new Calvinism and some older theologians, Presbyterian the theologians like B.B. Warfield and Charles Hodge, um, even in a lot of uh, confessional PCA Presbyterian churches, or really, you know, of all denominations, you will find people saying that, um, people talking about the Lord's Supper in a Presbyterian rather than a Presbyterian way, who will leave out mentions that we receive Jesus' true body and blood. Um, so yeah, that, that's the New Calvinism. Another uh, criticism that I and many others have had of the New Calvinism is uh, the fact that uh, the fact that it's very pietistic in some ways. Now it's good that they stress personal holiness. We all we all need that. That's very that's very important. I am not advocating against that. Pietism is something different. Pietism originally developed. Um, from the Lutherans, but it was in reaction to the way Lutherans did things, so it's very different from Lutheranism. Um, so pietism is this very strong emphasis on, like, personal good works as evidence of salvation, as evidence of being a true believer. And, uh, of course, there are many problems with that. It leads to no real assurance of salvation, and a lot of people in the New Calvinism have either left the left Calvinism or left the faith altogether because they were just living in a state of constant anxiety over whether they were really saved. Um, so John Piper uh, is kind of part of this, is kind of pietistic in his theology. Now, I'm a fan of John Piper in general, but I just think he de departs from Reformed theology in some significant ways. Like his book, Desiring God... Um, like, it's, it, it basically, he takes, it, John Piper takes after Jonathan Edwards a lot. Um, so John Piper is consistent with the teachings of Jonathan Edwards, who uh, has a similar problem where there's an overemphasis on what are your, what are the affections of your heart? Is your heart really inclined towards the things of God? And um, it's like, the, in like, moderate doses, that is good, but if you focus on that too much, there's an endless speculation over, am I really doing this for God, or do I have selfish motivations? Newsflash, you will always have selfish motivations for everything you do 100% of the time. That's the nature of total depravity, that's the nature of our human condition. So, um, it's not good to focus too much on that sort of stuff. So, some people have even just given up on their faith altogether, because they've just said, um... I guess I'm not really saved um, because I 
I keep struggling with these sins and, and stuff like that, and I, I don't seem to always desire the things of God. And John Piper did, I think, later write a book called When I Don't Desire God, which sort of addressed the criticisms and kind of improved what he thought. I didn't read that book, so I can't really speak to it. <laughs> but um, I... I I, I, I do I in these videos I do what I often do in book reports for school what I often did when, when when I was in high school I talk about things I have not read as if I have read them because I've just gotten some summary from someone else <laughs> that that's what I do a lot um but yeah so that's basically the new Calvinism um I went over a lot of figures in it and even though it has aspects of reformed theology I don't think it's really reformed in a historical sense. So if you want something that's truly Reformed, go to a more traditional Presbyterian or Dutch Reformed church. But yeah, that's just kind of my kind of my rant on this, my little spiel. I have a post about this too on Instagram that you can check out. So yeah, thanks for watching, and now I'm going to speed this up while I go mining.